Ah, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to this talk, which is entitled Solving for Locomotion in VR. Uh, it's something I'm very passionate about and uh, been doing a lot of work in, and so it's great to be talking with you here today about it. Uh, my name is Tom Heath. I work for Oculus. I have done since the relatively early days of 2013. And back in those days, I used to look into what worked well in VR and uh, what sort of best practices we could come up with, and generally researching the whole uh, uh, new thing of VR, at least uh, for this era. Um, in the last few years, I've been working with development teams across the world, kind of helping with integrating Oculus software, uh, working on best practices, uh, comfort, just anything that makes VR uh, you know, that bit better. And I've been uh, you know, learning from developers, I've been able to impart some advice as well, uh, and it's been good. And then the last uh, few months, I've been working on some research into locomotion and just sort of seeing how we can push that boundary forward. Um, and to that end, we've been exploring this whole, the whole space, not, the, not every single aspect of, of locomotion, but you know, we've picked a few areas that we'd like to research further, uh, try out, see if we can uh, find some things which really work and really sort of embrace sort of comfort for as wide an audience, even a total audience, if we can. So what we've done is, is kind of there to act as a springboard of, of ideas for developers to sort of take and advance further into their games. And, and their applications. And the idea is, is that we, we do some prototyping work that saves everyone some time. Um, we don't profess to know it all. In fact, we're learning much as we do. And um, so uh, we're learning about uh, these things. Uh, we can pass that information on. Uh, it's just a, a sort of pioneering attitude that a lot of you have. And you know, between us, hopefully, we can, we can push things forward. I've done a recent blog post uh, on our website, which is related to locomotion. Um, and it's that research which I'm going to talk about in more depth. Um, just to let you know that it is, it is available to download from our, our website. So um, a lot of what you see, in fact, everything that you see are implemented here, you can also download as part of our SDK, our PC SDK, so you can see it in action. Because uh, a lot of these things, you know, it really is good to, to try it out for yourself. So uh, ever so briefly, um, the, the locomotion that I'm talking about is uh, that movement which is beyond the kind of one-to-one -one movement within the range of the sensors. So um, it's movement beyond sort of those few meters around the sensors. It's uh, rotation that's beyond, you know, that's artificial, that isn't, isn't just your natural rotation. It's additional movement uh, that we all you know, want to do. A, a lot of applications want to do freely within games, but we find we've had to be a little bit cautious. Um, what are we solving? Just again, very briefly, it's that mismatch between what our eyes are saying. It's movement that our eyes are saying is happening, but our body and our inner ear is uh, sort of disagreeing and saying, no, that, that's not happening, and I don't feel happy about it sometimes. Um, and the reason why is because you know, games and applications have historically wanted to move a lot, and that's been part of some very exciting experiences. And if we can you know, do that in VR, then that just uh, well, I want VR to be sort of open to all of the possibilities that, that game designers and developers can think of. So, um, it's, people have been making great advances, so uh, that, that has to be said. Um, and in fact, some of the advances are to do with um, you know, having no, no locomotion at all. So there's been a, a, a great amount of innovation from developers uh, using sort of no motion uh, and working within that sensor range. And there's been some really great experiences just within that area. And then we have other games which have uh, sought to allow that greater movement. So teleporting is um, you know, a good one. Robo Recall did it very well, allowing you to explore this wider area, uh, really cover ground, and you know, teleporting works well. Um, Eagle Flight's another one where they've sought to mitigate the uh, potential discomfort that you might get from you know, a lot of movement. So they've brought in the field of view, they've made the periphery uh, dark, and this all, this all helps, and it's, it's great steps forward um, for VR as a whole. Games like Lone Echo have uh, allowed you to kind of drag your way through the world and, and in a sense, drag the world under you, and that has given a great sense of, uh, of comfort there. And then other games such as Minecraft have I've introduced comfort modes where you, you act as if the world, the VR world, is played through a, a TV screen or through a, a sort of portal. So that provides a nice grounding uh, rest of the, you know, outside of the TV, which then helps to, um, you know, make you feel as comfortable as possible. So there are these, um, you know, people are pushing forward all the time. And uh, what I'm going to present is uh, some of the things that we've researched. 
Um, there are plenty of areas for further research, but here are some that we wanted to share. It's very much um, something that we're, we're working together with developers. Uh, what, we've seen, what we've sought to do is we've prototyped some of these, um, these techniques, usually in a very simple framework so that it's just placeholder artwork, um, and you can kind of glimpse the kind of thing we're researching. But where we need to work with developers is we need to have real applications using these techniques because then you know, things can change sometimes and you get to see it really working um, how it should and you get to see further pitfalls if there are any or you get to see it working really well. So this is where it's something that we can um, you know, want to work with you. Um, and also we wanted to make it more interactive for you to get the benefit from this research. So rather than you know, a document which might you know, not so readily be absorbed, we wanted to present it in a way that you could actually experience it in VR. Because as, as I'm sure you all know, things, things really need to be experienced in VR to sort of see whether these techniques work, how well they're working. Um, so that's what we've done. So uh, this, as I said, this, um, everything you see here, and the, you see the, you'll see some videos of the things we've prototyped. You can download them all from our, the developer part of our website. It's in the PC SDK section. So it's part of the samples, part of the Oculus Room Tiny samples. It's a section on locomotion, so you can try all of these. And importantly, you can also um, you see the source code as well, so you can modify them, and um, there's, uh, there's benefits there as well for everybody if you can kind of take some of our work and advance it further. So, um, so I'm looking forward to sort of showing you one or two of these, these unusual directions. Just before I do, I wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of training wheels, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. We talk about it fairly frequently at Oculus. It's this sense that you might introduce elements into the game which uh, you might not particularly want in the full game. You might ultimately you know, not choose to have whatever these comforting elements are in you know, the fully immersive, full uh, version of the game. But there's something to get the player in, to get them acclimatized to your control scheme, to the type of movements, um, and also to appeal to a wider audience so people can, can play your game even if they feel like uh, they are quite susceptible to, to discomfort then they have a way in. So um, as you look at some of these uh, prototypes, you might think, oh my goodness, that looks a bit, um, a bit crazy. I'm not sure I could put that in my game. But think of it in terms of you might want to start somebody off with some element of, of what I'm presenting and then fade it away as, as they go. So it's just another tool to, to get more people in VR. So by way of a sort of brief agenda, uh, the, the types of things we've researched can be split roughly into five types of things. The first two are to do with movement, and in particular your perception of the movement that you're uh, having in VR. And um, the great thing, if you can do it, is make the player feel as if the world is the world moving, not them. So rather than you hurtling through this, this VR world, and it's like, oh, oh dear, that doesn't match what my, my ears are saying, instead if you can uh, get, give the perception to your user that the world is moving underneath them or around them, then you've eliminated that mismatch between the senses. So that's a good, very good way forward. So that's the first two items. And then uh, the third one, let me skip to that. So the third one is um, kind of experimental. It's um, how to reduce the um, sort of relevance of that mismatch between uh, the eyes and the ears. So can we sort of make your brain decide Yes, there's something a bit unusual going on. My eyes are saying one thing, my ears and my body are saying another. But can I convince my brain that that's just not important somehow? So we'll, I'll explore that. Uh, there's, there's optic flow. Um, that's one of the potentially problematic items when you're trying to um, uh, get your ears and, and eyes to agree, is you've got all this flow of optical information sort of flying past your eyes. Is there a way we can kind of mitigate that? and uh, kind of balance that out, cancel it out somehow. And then uh, finally, as, um, one of my favorites is just trying to fool the brain, just trying to, to do something that is just enough to allow your brain to think, ah, okay, well, that's not, that's not quite right, but there's some elements there where I think I'm, I think I'm okay with that. So that's one of, my, you know, one of the interesting things that you can do in VR is, is try these things and see, see where you can fool your brain. So the first category, um, which is one which has a lot of potential. So we've seen um, you know, diff there's different methods within this. So to recap, this is, this is where you're trying to give the impression to the user that it's the world moving underneath them. So you're trying to reassure them, reassure their visual system that 
there is actually no movement going on, that you are still comfortably where you think you are, that what your ears and your body are saying is, is correct, that you're, you're just moving you know, within the sensor range. There is no additional movement going on. So achieving this, move the world instead. And so I'm briefly going to mention a couple of varieties before talking about the, the little bit of research we've done on this. So um, one of the most ready ways of convincing you that the, the world isn't moving is to play, oh, sorry, that you aren't moving, but the world is, is to play on a, a tabletop. So uh, as you can see in, uh, in this screenshot of Brass Tactics here, you've got a, a VR world that is played on the tabletop. Now, whatever happens to that VR world, whether it moves or rotates or scrolls under you, you remain reassured that you aren't moving because you can see the distant room in the background. And you're, you're aware that that fits with the rest of your senses. And so overall, that's, that's comfortable. So if you can do a tabletop game, then great. Um, another variety to quick mention, quickly mention is when you, uh, you want to extend, you know, your game isn't relevant to a tabletop, but perhaps you can artificially introduce this sense of um, a static um, edge. So here we have like a, a grid that's been introduced in the background. And so no matter what happens within the, the driving game, the world can appear to be moving underneath you and flowing under you because of this static grid which doesn't move around and only moves relative to you know, when you turn your head, that's when it moves or when you sort of sidestep left and right. So um, the area we've, we've looked into a bit more, now this is, um, this is, we're starting you off gently here, so this is like a, an elaboration of, a, of something that you've, you've seen before. Uh, you may even have seen this before. Um, where you bring in the periphery of view. So when you have locomotion going on that has potential to be uncomfortable, perhaps with acceleration involved or, or your rotation, which uh, isn't represented by your actual body, then you can bring in this view. But rather than revealing sort of black, um, you're revealing something which is even more uh, comforting to your, to your visual system. It's revealing a, a world that matches what your senses are saying, a very static, in this case, a very static gray room. So you have the yellow VR content, which you can move around in and, and locomote in. And then whenever there's an issue, in comes the periphery, to whatever degree you wish, revealing this stabilizing uh, room. And um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that sort of one, one size fits all in, in terms of what you reveal in that periphery, because I think it very much depends on what your content is. And if you can get that, what's revealed in the periphery to fit with your concept, or perhaps you know, be, be something that's relevant to your game, then so much the better. And, and this is where you can, you can decide to bring in that periphery a lot, or you can do it a little. Um, you can even do even more things to reinforce that sense of, of comfort and stabilization you're getting from the periphery. You can, for instance, choose to make the yellow VR world go transparent, semi-transparent, so that you can see this gray world through, um, to, through the VR content. Um, another thing you can do, which um, I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, your brain is very inclined to think of the most distant uh, thing it's viewing as the, the sort of grounding, you know, what is real. Um, what I mean by that is when you're in like the yellow VR world and you look all the way into the distance, you see that the distance is, um, you know, some, something in the distance traditionally is, is, is the thing which is your, your frame, your frame of reference. So if you have a, a room, a gray room which is revealed, which is maybe only a few meters uh, wide, then you're less inclined to believe that that small room is the static real thing. But you could almost start to imagine that the room is actually moving around with you and that the yellow is in fact the real thing. So to get around this, if you can take out the depth information from uh, your VR world, if you can render it so that its, its depth is all at say a couple of meters away, then that makes it more uh, enticing to your brain to accept that gray static grounding world as the right thing and hence latch onto that more readily. So you can kind of see how uh, you can build up, you have choices about how much of this sort of comforting influence you can have from this technique. And um, so you could build up users into your game that way. Okay, another, again, starting gently again, this is another sort of elaboration on a theme. Um, this is where, you know, if you get somebody to do something they're familiar with, so if you played, if you played a game um, on your TV, for instance, we're all used to playing on, some, on large TVs, playing very uh, moving, interactive content, and we're quite happy to do that. So if you recreate that in VR, you re recreate a big TV, then 
great. And this is kind of akin to, to Minecraft's comfort mode. Um, but there's no restriction on the fact that you have just, just one of these or what size it is. So you can, we've created a test bed here with this application where you can, you can make them different sizes, sort of long and, and, and tall or wide or perhaps just a, a set of them all horizontally. And the floor and the ceiling are, are this sort of stabilizing gray world that you see in the gaps. And how big do you have those gaps? Could you start somebody off with perhaps you know, a, single, a single TV and then bring in additional sort of screens so that they can look around in VR and gradually reduce that gap until it's nothing? Um, again, you've got this sense of depth is quite important. So if you just render these as, as windows into the, your VR world, then you do uh, run the risk of, you, of your player perceiving that actually that green VR world is, is the real what's going on. And this room is somehow something that's moving around with you. So just like in the real world, when you have a TV uh, in front of you, if you can render things at the depth of that TV, so it appears that it is, it is right there in the TV, then you get maximum comfort from that. So, um, yeah, there's, there's possibilities here. Um, now, moving on to something a little bit more unusual that I'm pretty sure most of you won't have seen. Um, this is actually, with so many things in VR, it's quite hard to describe this to people. Very easy when you see it um, sort of shown here. But this concept is, um, rather than having some artificial uh, sort of grounding, sort of glimpse into your, um, into your static sort of comfort inducing gray world. We try now to incorporate it more into your actual game world. So as you can see here, you've got portals into this stabilizing world, but they're plotted in your VR world. So you can decide where they are. You can make them involved within your, your concept, within your uh, artwork. I mean, I've put them on sort of big blocks on the wall and there's, there's sort of cubes which have them in. But you can imagine that if you were leading a player into your game, you might decide that certain graphics in the early stages could just show portals into this stabilizing world. And then as people progress through the game, or if they choose you know, that they don't need it, then um, these can be reduced, they can be, become less frequent, and they can disappear completely. So uh, once again, the whole, you can make this more effective by reducing the depth of your green tinted VR world. You can make that pretty much monoscopic or so that it's rendered at a fixed depth, which just increases the, um, the comforting effect of the, of the gray. Um, what we do as well with some of these, um, with some of these um, techniques is we're kind of looking to see whether, um, you know, how well it works. So what we do is artificially introduce some horribly uncomfortable um, thing, in this case sort of lurching around kind of artificially, and you know, it really does test some of these techniques. And although you, know, you, can't, you can't see it completely, you know, seeing it 2D like this, it's better to experience in, in VR. But you can kind of get a sense that, can you see how readily your mind can kind of start to see that grounding gray room? And that's what some sort of hind part of your brain is picking up on and deciding that your visual system is reassured by a lack of motion. So you kind of separate the two off, even if your conscious mind is, is paying attention to the, uh, the green VR world. So, as I said, these are all things you can try out. Um, you, can, you can download them, and, and it's quite important to try them. And within this framework that we've provided, you can actually um, change these parameters. You can decide you know, to do, as I was saying, with changing the depth um, so that it's all close to you or whether it's fully into the distance. Uh, you can vary the size of the portals, that sort of thing. So it's all there for you to experiment with and really see whether that's something that would fit well with your, your game or application or allow you to do something a bit more to a wider audience. So the second uh, group of ways of um, you know, feeling like you're moving the world and you know, not you um, is, a, is you actually physically are operating that world. So you, you physically, with your hands usually, or with some method, you are manually moving this world. And that's really effective. So uh, we've seen that in some titles really well. So um, Lone Echo is very good for making you feel like you're pulling the world through with your hands. Uh, the Climb is another good one, where as you're climbing with your touch controllers, then you may well get the sense that hmm, it feels a little bit like I'm pulling the world downwards. 
which doesn't, doesn't diminish your experience, but actually it's a very good thing for your, your brain or particularly your subconscious to latch onto. Because if you feel like you're pulling the world downwards, uh, however subconsciously, that then means there's no conflict between your, your eyes and your ears. So you're perfectly comfortable with that. Um, what I wanted to, but I wanted to extend this a bit further because although you find that uh, you can do it, it's quite limited in fact how fast you can move when it's just your hands moving directly. So I've sought to give you a bit more reach. You know, how can you still get that sense of one-to-one -one that you're moving the world? Um, you know, how can you do that? And also how can you incorporate rotation as well? So um, this is kind of referred to as like sort of like a ski pole metaphor really. So um, what you're looking at here is that the blocks are touch controllers and they have conceptually a, a, like a pole coming out of the bottom. So it's like a pair of ski poles. And you just sort of grab on, you stick, plant them in the world and just sort of ski pole your way through. And it's actually, because you've got that extra reach and you, and you can actually you know, move very quickly. I've done it, gone a reasonable speed here, but not, not, nothing like you can actually do. But you can pole your way through really quickly. You can uh, give yourself momentum. You could do a movement and then release the poles, but then continue with constant velocity because that has no acceleration involved. So you can actually move around very intuitively because it's kind of tapping into your, your own intuitive understanding of how, how such a sort of physical metaphor works, how sticking a pole in, dragging through works. And what's also very good about if you can have a physical um, way of controlling yourself is you can add rotation as well. So that your rotation, Y-A-W rotation, uh, that you would like to also solve can be done on the same, with the same metaphor, really. So you stick a pole in, and then you twist the controller, and you can twist the world around, sort of left and right. Um, and it just works very intuitively. Um, I mean, we've just tried one, one aspect here, but there are other, other ways that you, know, you can imagine you can extend that whole idea of you manually pulling the world through. Um, and something else that we find as a result of the research is it's not always um, everybody's, not everybody shares the same instinctive um, way these things work. So for instance, when you stick the pole in and you rotate, um, there is one part of your mind thinking, yes, I believe I'm moving the world under me, so I'll rotate it that way if I twist. Another part of your, that's the more conscious part of your brain, which is playing the game, thinks actually twisting the other way would be uh, more intuitive. So it's interesting how these two compete. I don't think every person is the same, but this is why we do this sort of application um, for you to see this research so that you can try it out for yourself and see exactly what we mean without having to go to the trouble of implementing it or without really knowing the value of you know, how good it is. So this is just a quick route for you to be able to see that. So this is probably the most experimental category um, and it's mostly born out of the fact that I've, I've, seen, I've seen this working. Um, accidentally quite often in the past. A couple of years ago, I did a, a lot of research. Um, so this is all about, can we decouple the, the brain's, um, you know, what, what the brain is being told from your eyes and what it's being told from your ears and, and the rest of your body. If we could somehow make it decide that, oh yeah, these are different, but I, do I, perhaps I don't care. Um, once you get to that stage, it's actually really um, amazing what you can do. In fact, I thought I'd solved locomotion completely um, about two and a half years ago because I found I could just do anything with this. Um, and, but what happened was, is I, I believe that I, uh, I did so many experiments in the previous half hour that I completely sort of temporarily uh, broke that link between uh, what my ears and, and eyes were thinking. So I've got three areas that I, I kind of explored here. One is where you just do, do something so disruptive uh, in terms of the graphics that you're seeing. Uh, nothing, nothing harmful, nothing to make you uncomfortable, but just odd enough that you start to think, well, I'm not really quite sure I'm, I'm believing that, so I, I think I'll just suspend my disbelief and, and just go with it. Uh, I'll talk more about these things in a minute. These are just sort of headline mentioning them. Uh, another thing is to, is maybe you can, you can drown out movement by, by creating, sort of tricking your brain into sort of seeing lots of counter movement going on to the point where you start to think, well, is there any motion going on at all? Um, and the, f the final one is, can you make the world, the VR world, the one which potentially could discomfort you because of all the locomotion, can you make that seem so unreal and not relevant compared to, say, a, a cockpit around you that you, um, you, you reduce the relevance and there's no, there's no problem in your, in your head? So, as I say, this is the, the most experimental um, bits. So, uh, the, my first one, um, so this is, this is where I'm trying to break the link 
just temporarily, just harmlessly, uh, between your eyes and your ears. So what I'm presenting here is I've got my, my 3D world, and instead of just, just presenting it to the, the user, I'm doing a transparent version, and I'm kind of flipping it, uh, as you can see, kind of making a transparent version going the other way. So the end result is it doesn't seem that, um, it's not that disturbing because it's, it's not real, it's just unusual. Uh, and the key is you don't want to make anybody uncomfortable with you know, something like this. But it just lends, um, get, sort of instills in the user this idea that, okay, I'm not quite sure we can believe what our eyes are saying here, so perhaps we won't. And you know, I've seen this working where you watch this for a bit. I don't know how long you need to watch it or to what extent the graphics are, but these are areas for, for research. I just sort of put this in and just show this is a direction that I think might be interesting. And um, so yeah, so having, having done that, then you find that you can um, move fairly comfortably in that world. Uh, not everybody, and we haven't done you know, great trials on it, but it's an interesting area of research. So another thing that I've, I've done um, is, so in this example, you've got the, the gray, sort of the, the gray and, uh, and brown sort of VR world is there. And you can see I've sort of overlaid a slight sort of lurching motion just to sort of underline the point really, just to uh, create something which would potentially be uncomfortable. And I've overlaid on top of it a rather beautiful cockpit, which is that green thing. Um, and that's, that sort of cockpit is, is moving in the equal and opposite, it's in, moving in the opposite direction and it's moving more so. Um, either tw I think four times more, two or four times. And so the idea of this, I mean, it doesn't look like much here, but when you watch it in VR, that, that real VR world doesn't appear to be moving. You're completely, it's, it's almost like it's masked by this movement of the cockpit. And because you have no other sort of visual frames of reference in VR, then you're left feeling like, well, okay, that must be stationary then. So you've kind of magically lost that movement going on. And so you don't feel disturbed by uh, this, or that's how, you know, anecdotally, I, f I don't feel disturbed by the movement in the, um, of the VR world. Um, and it's very interesting. So if we can mask little bits of motion like that with some other interesting graphic, I mean, you can imagine that you could have uh, a sort of cockpit here, which is perhaps something a bit more you know, consistent with your game, perhaps sort of counter-rotating rings of some sort of, some sort of flashy scientific, sort of sci science fiction sort of overlay. Um, yeah, these are all areas for research, but having seen this, you can kind of think, hmm, I wonder what other motions I can mask. So very early for this, but um, yeah, can we mask all locomotion this way if we choose the right um, masking sort of graphics? And then uh, the last uh, sort of one in this category that I tried out was how can we get, um, how can we get you to disbelieve that, that that VR world with all that motion? How can we get you to just disbelieve it enough to just accept whatever's happening there? And in this example, I've, I've introduced the same lovely cockpit, which is rendered nicely and perfectly in VR. So it's at 90 hertz, and it's updating, and it's all distorted correctly. Um, and beyond that, though, I've changed the, other, the distortion of the main world. So I've made it seem less real. And the idea is, is that um, normally I would look at that, the more distant object, you know, the more distant VR, and I would choose that as my sort of grounding graphics. I would say that is reality and I don't really care what this cockpit's doing. In fact, this cockpit's probably moving around with me. Um, but if I can take away, um, take away the reality of that, rather like in the, the, the space games that, are, that have done so well, that in those games where you have a, a cockpit, you're very reassured by that cockpit because everything outside the world in space has, sort of has this unreal quality. So you're not looking for that to ground you. You're not looking for that, that space with all its moving asteroids and things. You're not looking for that to tell you where you know, where's my stable frame of reference? So you are reassured by a cockpit. So perhaps we can extend that into games where they actually do have you know, corridors and ground-based objects. Um, so this is a way of just trying to empower the, the, co the static cockpit a bit better. Having said that, um, not all of our research works brilliantly, and actually this one's pretty poor. Um, didn't really work, actually. Um, it turned out that the, if you change the, um, the way the distortion's happening, on the main world, which is what I've done in the, the demo and the prototype, which you can download. It doesn't really disturb the reality of that VR enough. So 
Um, that, so this particular one doesn't really work that well. However, the concept, I think, is, is, has merit because um, I've, seen, I've done a version of this where I reduced the frame rate of the real world. So I diminished its reality by making it go at half frame rate or a quarter frame rate. And in that case, um, or even though you're still enjoying the experience and you can be doing your, uh, your game or your application in that uh, normal VR world, you are left, um, you're left feeling that um, you know, that's, that's not real enough and that I'm going to believe, I'm going to get my comfort and my stability from, from the cockpit. Um, so I think that one has, has merit. Um, and also, it's, it's very enticing for developers if, you, if in some way the, the, the magic bullet was uh, rendering at a lower frame rate. That, that would be quite lovely. Um, also, you know, maybe you could have it monochrome or the VR world, or you could diminish its reality by uh, some sort of shader. Um, it's just an area of research. Uh, but I think it's one that is, is very interesting. So the fourth category, um, optic flow. So when you're in VR and there's locomotion going on, um, you've got all this, this graphics flowing past your visual system, and they're kind of indicating you know, you're, you're moving and that might be problematic. So what I've sought to do here is, can we provide an, an antidote to that? Can we find, provide equal and opposite optic flow? Would that actually mitigate or maybe even eliminate um, any potential sense of discomfort? So. Um, yeah, this is one of those ones where um, it's quite jarring to look at. So remember the whole training wheels thing. You don't have to have your, you know, your game doing this. I mean, some games might think this is wonderful. But um, what you can see here is um, you can see the, the real VR world. And when we're not moving, that's all you see. But as you uh, perform various acts of locomotion, then an equal and opposite sort of flow of whatever the graphics are on the screen is, is flowed the other way. Um, this involves... And it works actually, for me, it works very well. And for others, it works very well. Uh, and for some, it's you know, not quite as convincing. So I think people are, are a bit different, or maybe we just haven't hit on exactly the right way of doing this. Um, but it's interesting. And, um, and what we get to do when we prototype, we get to solve a few of the problems that arise um, for you, really. So when you first do this, it's relatively simple to implement, I guess. But you rapidly find that if you're trying to get an opposite optic flow, uh, the most convenient thing is the world that you've already got. But of course, if you flow that backwards while you're going forwards, you can run out of world pretty quickly. Or it, it deviates from you know, the same look as the bit of the VR world that you were just in. So you know, we've, we've got a few parameters there where we kind of reset the world that's flowing past you. And um, there's a few sort of things, little things we have to solve and, and get right. But it's helpful because it lets you see at least a solution or two of how it works. And then you might be able to think how you might be able to extend that, or you know, maybe green isn't your color, but maybe there's some other way you can represent that. Because you don't want the user thinking accidentally that, that the reverse optic flow is the real world. But actually, we find that um, you can disengage from it quite well. Um, you can see that, that proper VR world, and you can decide, I'm looking at that. Um, yeah, so, so we, um, we need more engaging content, really. I mean, we put in sort of a game, a little mi like a mini game in these, which you'll see if you download the app. But it's not quite the same as a full game. So um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it really is useful to have like, proper applications, full games, working with some of these techniques. So um, one of my favorite things to do is, um, which often you, know, you happen upon with some sort of crazy idea, and you have to kind of just go with it and see how it works, uh, is just fooling the brain. So you know, can you give the brain just enough of whatever it wants um, in order to um, make things you know, comfortable for everybody? So this particular experiment builds on the whole idea of head tilting as a way of, of allowing comfortable acceleration within VR. So I'm sure you've all played applications where you, you know, lean, lean your head forward or from side to side, and that manifests itself as an acceleration in the game, and it feels comfortable. So um, I wanted to go a step further, because one of the you know, potential limitations of that is it's kind of hard work, or a bit of manual labor, I suppose, to be tilting your head all the time. And sometimes you don't want to be tilting your head forward when there's something of interest above you. So I thought, what if we, um, instead of inquiring you to tilt your head, what if we uh, just artificially pretend you tilted your head? So we feed in the graphics to the, to the player. We, we rotate the world, basically. So as if they did tilt their head, but they didn't. And I know that sort of feels like, oh my goodness, you can't, you can't do that. That's, that's just crazy. We're, we're always told not to, not to start artificially tilting the world. And you'd be right. 
But it's a case of, um, you know, is it, which is the, the lesser evil, really? Because we've got this big, you know, if we want some big accelerations going on, then they could potentially be uncomfortable. Whereas if we can replace them with the much lesser discomfort, potentially, of just rotating your head a little bit, then maybe that's the better way to go. So this one's pretty interesting because um, there's so many, like it's, it's, it's a double stretch, you know, to think, oh, I'm not sure that'll work. And yet it strangely does. Um, so, you know, you don't have to take my word for it, just try it out. It doesn't absolutely work for everybody, but a, a large number of uh, people internally. What you can see here then is I'm, all I'm doing is using the keyboard just to drive around, you accelerate around, rotate around this, this world, I'm not actually tilting my head at all, really. And yet you see all these tilts occurring. It's almost like I'm flying. And what the, the software is doing is it's taking the accelerations that, that my inputs are saying, it's working out what sort of head tilt should I have done in order to make that comfortable, and then pretending that that head tilt happened by tilting the world. And um, yeah, it, it kind of works. Um, and so um, sometimes with these things though, as I mentioned before, there is this, you are introducing a, a, a rotation of your head which, which isn't really there. So you have to be careful with that. So tempting as it is to um, you know, do just the right amount, sort of scientifically work it out and work out just the amount of, right amount of tilt that would give you a component of gravity that matches the acceleration going on. Very tempting to do that. And in fact, I think I advocated that at one point, but actually doing a little bit less than that means you get a good balance between um, you know, the sense of, of comfort and not doing anything too exaggerated to you know, create um, potential discomfort somewhere else. So um, yeah, generally there's, this, there's, there's not a lot of hard science in there and it's a big sort of hefty dose of just trying things out and, and pioneering things. And I know that's what a lot of, a lot of you as developers have been doing and it's, it's frankly great because you know, the more things we can try, um, the more we can find these, these things that you know, strangely work. So, um, there, is, there, is more, um, there is more to come. I mean, there's a, I have a huge list of software techniques that I still am yet to try. Uh, I'm anxious to try them. I, I talk with developers and they have other things they would like me to try. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. And, um, you know, that's what we'll, we're gonna get on and do. I just want to reiterate again, having seen um, a lot of that, a lot of those graphics in a sort of prototypes like that are kind of, ooh, I'm not sure I could, I could put that in my game. That's a, that's a bit crazy, isn't it? You know, that, not sure that green stuff flying backwards or, or all those portals are quite gonna match my game. So I just wanted to reiterate this idea that they don't, they don't necessarily have to live in the, the ultimate version of your game. But if there's a way of, you know, as, as training wheels, as, as getting people to be more familiar, to slowly get used to your game, um, and also perhaps encouraging a wider audience. So people are reassured that, oh, it's okay, I, I can play that game because I can invoke all these, uh, these special graphics or these different techniques. Uh, then you've suddenly got a, a, a potentially wider audience, uh, which is great. And then, you know, as people become acclimatized, perhaps, uh, perhaps you know, all, all, for all players, the training wheels can disappear or be reduced. Um, but something I should say is pretty much every method that I've shown um, has a very ready way of uh, diminishing it sort of gradually. So it's not like it's either on or off. Uh, usually they have a way of, of, you know, you can have an exaggerated version of these training wheels, or you can start to shrink them down. So the size of your, uh, your periphery can be less. Uh, the gaps between your, your portals of where your, you know, well, how many portals you have to show the real world, so show the sort of static grounded world, they can be reduced. You could even reduce your, your portals to smaller and smaller until they're just icons that represented something that used to comfort you. Um, maybe that's enough. So these are, these are areas for research, but uh, generally they're all good techniques for just, you can diminish them and gradually reduce them to nothing, depending on how well the player is doing and how comfortable they feel. So um, as I said, we have lots of other directions that I, I'm going to be exploring, and I will be, and I think we're going to continue this format of actually presenting them to you in a downloadable, um, you know, in downloadable source code that you can compile and run and modify. Uh, I think that's very useful. Um, there's a whole raft of things that I, I want to try next. Uh, there's also some sort of quite out there things that I, I want to try as well. Um, I often sort of say to my colleagues, I'd like to try... Um, well, when, I, when I'm driving fast in my car, actually, I tend, to, um, I tend to notice that I'm bracing my neck against the acceleration that's to come. And I find if I do the same thing 
um, in VR than I, I, well, I accelerate in a, in a VR car game. I miss that sense that my neck is bracing against an acceleration. But I can make myself comfortable by just sort of pressing on my forehead, providing that sort of bracing from my neck. And then I can accelerate really fast in VR, and it's fine. So, you know, I'm very interested in, you know, is that maybe a way forward? Maybe you can steer yourself by pressing against your, your head in various ways and engaging your neck in ways, and your other muscles in ways that are gonna um, make you think, oh yes, acceleration happened. So I know that isn't gonna help your, your inner ear telling you that the acceleration has happened, but there are other parts of your body like your, your muscles which are all providing information. And if you, can, if you can get those muscles to report, yes, okay, this is valid, then you can uh, get more comfort that way. There's other, other aspects like, um, can you disrupt the accelerometers in your ears? Can you use vibration, you know, whether it's audio or, or sort of direct vibration? There are these um, you know, techniques you could, we could look into there. Um, generally, one of the biggest things that we want to be doing, though, is taking some of these prototype techniques and actually seeing them work in real applications and real games. Because then I think we're going to find, you know, if there are flaws to the concepts or we're going to find sort of nuances that work better. Um, so I think that's something that we, we definitely want to do. We'll try and add them to our prototypes, but I think the way forward is probably to work with developers and try and get these introduced into actual games and applications that are coming out. So definitely a case of, of working together. Um, I have found that we're working with developers over the last few years, there have been lots of opportunities where we've had some issue that we would like to solve, some little facet of, of a game we'd like to make more comfortable. And we have done this process where um, we've prototyped some things, a game developer has, has chosen the one which works well, and we've had some, some back and forth, and it works really well. So definitely a, a collaboration is a good thing. And I'm always open to discussing these things. Um, in fact, I've on the, the show floor, uh, even within Connect, I've seen some really interesting things that I hadn't thought of about how to um, mitigate and how to, uh, dis potential discomfort and how to, how to get things working. So I'm learning a lot, and I really encourage that whole process of, of us sharing things and kind of making our way there to getting things, uh, you know, getting locomotion that really can be whatever our designers can think of. I'd like to get to that stage. I think we will, and I just want to get there quicker, really. So um, it's exciting stuff. So definitely want to continue the discussion after this. Um, you can email me at any time, tom.heath at oculus.com. Um, we can have the mics open in a minute for questions now, but um, I'm very happy to continue the discussion with anybody via email, outside, uh, even uh, you know, visits to developers. So um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. I'm looking forward to solving it more and more. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, do step up to the mics, but otherwise, yeah, thank you very much for your attention.